Welcome to In The Zone, your mental strength and endurance sports podcast with Micah, sports psychologist, and myself, Thierry, endurance sports coach. Today, we're going to talk about a few things. First, we're going to just introduce ourselves, uh, who we are, where we come from, what do we do, uh, so you guys get to know us a little bit more. We're also going to talk about um, suffering, which will be our first topic. Uh, our second topic will be about indoor versus outdoor training. And then we'll have some any other business so you guys know what we're up to these days. So, Micah, hello. Hi. <laughs> Good to be here. Oh, who are you? So I'm Mike van der Plaan. I'm from the Netherlands and uh, I live in Switzerland. I'm a sports psychologist registered here in Switzerland. I'm also a mental strength coach and uh, I work with uh, athletes from all levels and all ages. A very interesting profession. I'm really enjoying it to the max. I'm working for different centers here in the region uh, around uh, Lausanne and Coppe and Nieuw. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, myself, so I'm uh, Thierry, I'm uh, Swiss, I live as well here in um, Switzerland in Fune, near Geneva. Um, I'm an endurance sports coach, uh, specialized in triathlon, running, cycling, um, everything with basically endurance. Um, and yeah, I love I loved triathlon, that's my main sport, especially long distance, so Ironman triathlon. I've done a few of those and uh, keep on doing them. And that keeps me pretty busy. And here we are with our new project, a little podcast about mental strength and endurance sports. I reached out to you, I think it was about almost a year ago. That was just for myself. Um, and I was telling, I was asking you, how can I go more into the red zone? So that was our first bond, basically came from this, <laughs> this suffering aspect. So perhaps we can talk now about suffering. And what is it? Why do we want to suffer? Is it good to suffer? When should we suffer? Um, suffering is kind of a buzzword um, and something we maybe take a little bit for granted. But if you dig a little bit deeper, on a more psychological level and also physiological level, what is it? So I, th I think um, there's, there's, a, there's a few things we can talk about. So first thing, how would you define suffering? Well, you can look at it from a psychological perspective and physical perspective. If I look at the mental side of suffering, I would say it is uh, the capability to deal with adversity and also to deal with uh, the, the voice in your head telling you, I ha you have to stop. I mean, um, if I look at my own experience, sometimes if you enter the red zone, there's only this voice in my head that is telling me, if you do, if you just continue, you will ruin yourself. Uh, it's not worth it. Just uh, stop and uh, you will be fine. Be nice to yourself and so forth. So suffering to me is really responding to the pain in your body and stopping. The ability to deal with the voice in your head uh, telling you to stop. Hmm. It's the mental side to suffering. From my point of view on the injury sports, suffering, the way I would define it is going basically to almost the maximum of your ability or even beyond the maximum ability. So you're really putting a lot of stress on your body and you can suffer for different length of time. So if I will do a half an hour or one hour or two hour session, you can suffer differently through the session because you're basically pushing yourself very hard and then having that little moment of rest at the end, pushing on and off. And, and 
there's there's suffering in training so that's that's basically doing your your interval work where you are you need to stress your body to basically improve right so if you if you never go faster you rarely going to 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 improve but actually well you find out that it's during the recovery phase that you improve but you need to put that stress through your body and and there you have you need to have the ability to to suffer in a way and then on the on the racing point of view is basically where you have a 5k or 10k run race if you don't put yourself through misery if you're not suffering you're not giving your best and that's something very difficult to do. So what you're saying is you have to stress your body to improve. And with that stress comes also suffering. Yes. Okay. Because suffering in that sense is the stress you put on your body. And the question is, how much do you want it? How much... How, how can you quantify that stress? So this is the part of the, the, the physiological aspect. So you want to stress your body to improve. But then there's also that, that, that links really well to the psychological point of view of how long can I do it and do I really want to do it? Or if I even start to enjoy suffering. I sometimes encounter people who say, I love this, I love to go in this zone where I have, I am in pain, but it's it's where I want to be because that's where I discover new things. That's where I see myself differently. That's where I know that if I finish, I will be proud about myself. There are so many aspects to that suffering that are helping me to continue to go on. So it's still suffering psychological suffering because something I mean there's always this duality between being uh, able to go on and even knowing that you will be super proud if you finish and then this voice telling you you really have to stop here because it's too much it hurts too much why do you do this and so forth so it's this understanding how to deal with the two voices or maybe more voices in your head and um, why you're why why you're actually doing it to yourself because it's as easy to stop and just go back home and sit on the couch. But we've we, we've all been we've well all, most of us have been there where you're in a race, you're going hard, and yes, you've got these two voices. So which one? Imagine now I'm on my five k. I'm running as hard as I can, and there are two voices. Which one do I listen to? Yes, exactly. Or maybe both. But how can I train mm -hmm. to listen to one voice rather than the other? I'm not sure if you can just, you can give one more attention than the other. You cannot um, just no. close down or ignore hmm. one or the two. Because they're both there. So either way you have to accept the fact that some part of you want to stop. And some parts of you want to continue. How you can prepare yourself for that is first, I would say the, the key question is, why are you there? What is the reason you want to finish? What's the reason you want to go deep during the training? Depending on the situation, you have to ask yourself, why are you doing it? So the, yeah, the first, I think the first big question that people have to ask themselves is, why am I doing this? Yes. Why? Am I doing this sport or this race or this competition or whatever it is? Once you know your why, you might be able to either suffer or not. Exactly. Because you might think, actually, I don't need to suffer because my why is that and I don't need to suffer. But if my why is qualifying for Hawaii, well, <laughs> at some point, you're going to suffer. Yes, exactly. So yeah. that's the, uh, the first question, yes. really. Yes. So, so how, would you, how do you normally question that? Not to go too much into detail into the why, but how do you approach this with people? Well, the first question I ask people, athletes, why are you uh, doing what you're doing? So what is the reason behind your sports? 
what is the reason behind you uh, doing a competition for races? And that's a pretty difficult question. It's not something you would answer in an hour. It's something you have to chew on for a few days. And it's an interesting process. It's not like I'm asking you a question and you will get, give me a straight answer. It's a reflection process that will make you discover a little bit about yourself and the way you reason and the way you are motivated. So it's also about motivation. What is motivating you? What is behind the reason you want to do the race? If I would ask you, do you want to go to Kona one day? Well, yes. Well, yes. But why? That's the big question. What is it that drives you to go that far that you would qualify for Kona? It's not easy to qualify. And then even doing the race is not uh, something which is um, done in, in it's, it takes a lot of ex experience, a lot of preparation. It's, it might be a life project for some of us. Yeah, because qualifying for such a race, for example, if that's your why, why do you do triathlon? I mean, uh, most people would probably answer, do you want to qualify for Kona? They probably all will say, well, yeah, I'd love to qualify. But it, is that your why when you're in the race? Not, probably not. That's not why you're, you're in it. So when you suffer at the end of the marathon in Ironman, taking my example, you have to really dig deep to push yourself. And that is where the why is really important. Not necessarily the carrot, as in I want to qualify. That's great, but there's much deeper reasons on why you do the sport that can enable you to suffer and go through that that pain which is required like i said before to go beyond your ability or at your max let's say and I mean, when i say max i'm not saying max speed i'm just saying you're you're the best on the moment the best your 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 best self at this moment and Quite often, we, we probably underestimate ourselves, actually, when we think that, for example, you're running as hard as you can in a 10K race, you're going at four minutes per K. You know, could you have gone 355? Most probably. For sure. So where's the gap? Yes. And do I want that? Or what motivates me to go that far? And I think it's super important if we talk about the why behind what we're doing, also understand what is motivation. So you have this difference in psychology between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And the intrinsic motivation is something which really comes from within us, which is far more powerful than something that motivates you and that comes from outside us. So an example could be, I am motivated to go to Kona because I want to discover myself during that process of preparation. I want to understand better how I react under pressure. I want to understand, or I see it as a discovery. I see it as a journey, a long journey, a long process, where I just uh, want to understand better who I am throughout the process. That's a very deep um, intrinsic motivator. And uh, many people would argue that that is far more powerful than, for example, I want to have the uh, some prize or I want to go and be on the podium. Of course, that's also interesting, but or having a personal best. But what we were just saying is if in the end I have to push hard, but I see I won't achieve a personal best, then why would I push? Yeah, but you can have also some external motivations, like if you're running side by side with someone and there's one kilometer to go, you know, in the end, okay, it could be for the first place, okay, great, but it could also be for the place number 300 because there's, I don't know, 500 people participating in the race, but at that moment, you might still be motivated to push hard because you just want to beat the guy next to you. Yes. And that's an intrinsic motivator mm -hmm. because that's something which comes from within you because you're competitive and you like to win from other people. It's not because someone outside is judging you 
uh, to be the best. You don't care about that. You don't care about which place you will end. You care about the fact that you will prove yourself, not your parents, not your friends, not anyone else yet yourself, but yourself, that you're able to beat the guy next to you, whoever that is. But, uh, and are you able to go, that, that's the thing. When we first talked, I remember a while ago, I said, I was giving you the example that in some races, we are able to, to, to go really deep and then other races, you just, you just can't. And that's, that's, you're not giving up, but you're negotiating with yourself and ultimately the negotiation fails and you don't go as hard as you, as you can. So the question is, should you suffer at every race? Can you, how often do you have, it's like a, you know, a box full of matches and you just basically how many matches do you have during the year during the season yes i think you have to choose like your training plan you also have to train where do i want to suffer or where do i need to suffer some races you know i need to go deep to be able to achieve my objectives so uh and if you are not clear on what your objectives are so actually your why and why am I motivated to dig deep, dig deep, then you probably will end up negotiating and you will always lose. Your body will always win from, and your voice in your head will always win from you and from your objectives and from everything you want from that race. Because you can tell yourself at home that you wanna go deep, but if you do not know why or how that fits in your program, it's not gonna happen. So I would say, no, you don't need to go and suffer all the time. You need to be intelligent uh, in, in when do you want or go and, 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 and suffer. And some people do suffer every time. They love it. So why not? But if you know that you have a hard time doing so, you have to be very smart on where, when do I do it. Yeah. So I did um, the Everest uh, challenge this summer. And... Yeah, it was, it was it was tough to do it, you know. Physically, it was it was it was t it was a long day. It wasn't really difficult because I was going at low wattage, you know, taking it relatively easy, if we can say easy. But mentally, that was really really difficult because there were moments that I was just on my own for a very long time, and I found that after that event, the next day, I was I was fine. I had no you know, no pain, nothing, I was, I was okay. But the next few weeks, actually, I was finding it really difficult to go back on the bike. And I don't think it was anything to do with the, the pain. Okay, you have some, a little bit of muscle fatigue and it's a big event. But for me, it was all about the, 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 the mental aspect of, oh, why do I want to go back on the bike again? Although I really wanted to, when you, but once you're on it, you're not able to give your best in some little hills or whatever. I think this willpower is like a muscle. So yes, physically you were fine because you didn't go physically so deep that you need to do, have this recovery of days, but your willpower did go deep, so deep that you needed also the recovery. And sometimes this recovery will maybe take, take a week or two weeks. Um, that's, that's, that's obvious because, um, it took you how many days? I don't know, but I mean, for, for a few weeks, for sure. I yeah. was just yeah. not really feeling motivated to train because I was like, oh, I, I, why again? Like, you know, so you just want to rest, you know, and, and I think it was more mentally than, than anything else. You see why, what you were asking yourself, why again? Yeah. So again, this why. Exactly. Uh, so the willpower is like a muscle and your willpower muscle was just exhausted and you have to give it a break. And I think that's exactly where we also can practice to be kind to ourselves and to be very selective when we put really a lot of mental pressure on ourselves and when we just let it go for a while. Yeah, another, another scenario, like you said, about planning during a season would be to say, okay, I've got my preparation races, training races, whatever you want to do, call it. And during the ones which are, 
you know, B race or C race even, which is just basically like a training day, you know, practicing what you're going to do in your A race. Yeah, there are some people who are just going to go deep every single time, you know, and okay, there, there's some outliers all the time. But I think what I would do is to just really focus on your objectives and keep your bullets for the one that really matters. And then you, you have all these all these all these bullets, all these matches, all this this sort of free mental strength to to put into that that uh, so you, so you can train throughout the season to to let's say suffer or dig deep in some aspects. But when it really matters and you know that you've got to basically redline the thing, then you've got enough bullets to do to do so. Yes, I think I think that's true, and I also think we need to. Um, separate real, real suffering, like finishing a very, very difficult race and digging super deep and knowing that we'll destroy our willpower for a few weeks and even our body for maybe 10 days, or not destroy, but at least have a, get, a, get into a state where we need a serious recovery and suffering during um, our normal training where we are maybe a little bit in pain but it's necessary to get enough stress on the body to improve because I would say if we choose only to suffer a few times a year then we would not be able to push ourselves throughout the year when the body also needs to be pushed because also many people would maybe hold back uh, during um, interval training uh, only because they are afraid of what they will need if they push a little bit harder. So I would I would say separate maybe the big bullets mm -hmm. as you mention it and the normal suffering which we actually do every day because I'm sure that every day not only in sports but also in normal life we do suffer mentally because we're doing something which is maybe um, annoying or which is uh, something we look up to. We need to suffer um, to be able to improve or to progress. Um, it's just a matter of how much do, are you able to uh, handle and you're definitely also able to improve that very quickly. Even. Yeah, and, with, and something I was thinking about is just not just the we're talking here mostly about the mental aspect of, of, of suffering. A little bit the physical side as well, of course, like you can suffer in a race and you know your body aches, your muscles are screaming to stop. That is suffering. What we're not talking about is suffering in terms of, you know, if, if you get injured through in a race, for example, you pull a muscle, just don't suffer, as in don't just you know, take it easy. There's no point of, well, unless basically you're first and then you have the guy, you know, there, there's different, well, but we're not talking about suffering in terms of physical pain because of an injury and you just have to push through the injury. No, that's that's not what we're talking about. But um, the, the aspect, I think, of, of suffering and that trainability of suffering, and like you said about interval training, is to go step by step and start with short intervals, then increasing them a bit longer, making them either a bit longer, a bit harder, different as, you know, to, to build that confidence. Because obviously if you start with a one minute interval, okay, you can, you can do it, then do it again, then, and again, and again, you know, so three, four, five, six times, and then instead of doing six times one minute, you do six times two minutes. And, and these things you gradually build through the season to build that confidence that you can go through this suffering, if you will, that really hard pace. And that's kind of where you kind of have this bank of suffering bullets and you, and you put it in that bank and you have that confidence. Then when you go to race, you can pull out of that bank and hit hard. But obviously that bank becomes empty at some point and you have to restore that energy mental energy that, that that you need for 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 a next race yes yeah so it's the experience that counts 
it's throughout the year if you have had uh, some hard trainings you build up as you're saying the confidence mm. which is super important confidence self-confidence the the, the 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 ability to tell yourself look i know i can do this uh, i'm ready for it this is i would say the most important part um sometimes athletes come to me and ask me to help them on the mental side but then i ask them to come back in a while because i first want them to gain confidence through experience because if we do not build up the hours and go out running in rain uh in wind and in difficult uh, conditions we do not build up this experience that we need to uh, face the adversity during the race so we can you know give i can give them a lot of uh, mental tricks or a mental training but i think uh, most importantly is the experience but then if you are experienced then what can you do uh, extra to prepare yourself for this suffering that is coming up in the race well, there are different there are so many different things you can do um, what you could do for example is uh, especially in winter time we're uh, soon in winter uh, many people will go indoor training um, you can try to you know not to train with music for example and just to be still and try to focus on your training uh, and, and the movement um, so there, there are many techniques. So as a, as a bit of a key takeaway from, from suffering, what should we, what, what are the things you would, that's your, your top tips on suffering or the ability to suffer or, you know, just a, around that, that topic of suffering, because, you know, just to say to someone, well, just toughen up. Well, no, that's. It's, it's, we like to say that, well, you just got to toughen up, but it's not really a good advice, you know, uh, train to be tougher. Okay. You're not going to tell yourself today, I'm going to be tough on the bike. So why would you say the first things to, to, yeah, your top tips on suffering. My top tips on top suffering. Tips. So the one is the why, the first one. The first one is the why. Yeah. That's clear. Why are you doing this? This is a process you have to go, go through. And maybe also it's very um, a lengthy process. So you still have to, you have to keep on asking yourself before a race, why do I do this? What are my objectives? Uh, and what do I do when I start to negotiate with myself? Another thing is try to identify your thoughts before a race. So what am I thinking when I'm under pressure? What is it that, what is that voice in my head actually telling me? How, um, and, and write it down. Try to keep a journal a few weeks before a race and try to get hold of your thoughts. Uh, what are the positive things you're thinking? What are the negative things you're thinking? What part of you is trying to convince you to stop? What part of you is trying to convince you to continue? Just to get a better idea about what it is that you're thinking because it's a very unconscious process that could be in in trainings for example yeah you can so during definitely. your interval training yes, work exactly. yeah. yes so uh, and make sure you are prepared to do so so when you start your interval training just you know stand still for for a few seconds and put yourself give yourself the attention intention to uh, be aware of your thoughts then after your interval training just take a journal and write it down Write it down and do some free writing. So do not um, try to write down everything perfectly. Just write down everything you think and write down your thought during the interval training. Okay, that's and and that way you get a better idea of what's happening in your head and to make it more conscious because we're so often unconscious. And if this unconscious dialogue is there. When you're about to give up, you're, you'll definitely give up. Whereas if you're more conscious and you are warned or you are prepared to listen to this dialogue, there's also more chance that you can interfere. Yeah. And there's also perhaps the visualization aspect where yes. you can anticipate that moment and, and visualize yourself doing it that could be before a workout yes. and just to know that you look at the workout that you have to do yes or a race that you have to do yes and try to basically 
you know that at this point, you know that you're going to have to go through a hard, tough moment. So it's just about knowing the workout or knowing the course that you're going to race to anticipate that, that, that suffering. Because if the suffering comes as a surprise, it's probably really difficult. But the more prepared we are, I, could, I don't know, it could be both ways actually. The more prepared we are, the more negotiation, negotiation time we have uh, or not. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, uh, yes. And I think the visualization is an excellent way to prepare a race. So I would definitely recommend you to start at least one or two weeks before your race and to visualize different aspects. So yes, we can try to anticipate on this negotiation moment, but it's difficult because we are not, we, it's super difficult to really imagine how it is when you're in it. Whereas imagining how it is to pass the finish line, that's much easier. So I would, I would rather advise to, you know, visualize visualize dif different stages so if you know that for example there will be a moment where you are totally completely alone then visualize that see yourself running you can do that from different perspectives you can visualize it as you being in in the run or in the race uh, or you can picture yourself from imagine you are sitting in a drone or you see yourself running both are fine I would say try both, and the one that is most easy for you, you keep that one. So for me personally, it's much more easy to visualize while I'm running. So I really, I close my eyes, I stand still or I sit down, but best is to stand. And I visualize how it is to run, for example, in the dark, being totally alone, hearing my breathing, um, just looking around. And I really try to not only visualize the physical part, so how do I run, how do I feel, but it's also the mental part. So what state am I in and what state would I like to be in? I would like to be in a state where I feel pushed, um, challenged, but sharp and awake and grateful, for example. Those are values that are important for me and I would like them to be there I would like to be in that mental state when I'm alone running in the dark, for example. So that is what you can visualize. You can also visualize the finish line. Yeah, Having positive your family, thoughts. Yes, very positive thoughts. Having your family there, your children, I don't know, your parents, your friends being super proud of you. And you just capture that, you just visualize that and play it like a movie over and over again. That's something very powerful and it will definitely help you to push through because your brain has already anticipated. Because the brain has the, uh, often the, 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 the um, before a race, the brain anticipates often something negative. So that's why we're getting stressed. So we have to counteract that with, for example, the visualization exercise where we picture or visualize something positive. Not only a positive event, but also a positive state of mind. And that's most important. So you really try to prep your brain to switch from something that is maybe negative or difficult into something that is positive and pushing us to go through, to go on. Yeah, I think I think for, for me, the, the, the biggest takeaway from today really is the why the, the why, I mean, we always go back to this question, but it is the why you are doing this, you know, and, and I, I coach some people who just come to me and say, I want to do this running race, I want to do this and that, and um, I say, okay, we, you prep, okay, you want to do the, you want to you wanna run, okay, we're going to put, put you through some, some, some interval training, this and that, okay, go through the motions, and then all of a sudden you see that they're not able to, to, to do the intervals, and, you know, based on different uh, testing that I've done, they should definitely be able to, to do it. And then you ask the question, well, first I should ask the question, but you ask the question, why do you want to do this? And they tell you, well, I just, I want to, I want to be fit. I just want to, I want to be fit and healthy for, for now. And you go, but you are already fit. So why would you need to push yourself 
harder if you've already accomplished your your goal. So that's that's for me really the the the, the key of, for suffering um, and and how many times during the year you have to to to, to do it. And it, like we said, we don't have to suffer all the time. It's just something very unique. Not everybody can do it, and many people have different levels of suffering. So what I consider suffering might be nothing for some others, or the opposite might be just hell. So, so we have really a different aspect, and and it's not because, for example, we say I'm going to do a 5K versus a marathon. It's you know both are equally as suffering if you go do your best. So you have as well different levels of suffering depending on the length and the pace that you, you go at. Because obviously if you go marathon, the first 5K of the marathon, they're, they're easy, right? You're, you're not suffering at all. The last 5K, <laughs> you're suffering like hell, but it's still the same pace, you know? So it's, it's completely different. And, and there you're requiring much more your, that, that's when the psychological aspect comes into play. You know, are you able at that moment to just go hard or keep that pace, or are you basically slowing down? And then, but again, we go back to the to the why. I mean, we could we could discuss a few tips also on just simple mental tricks. Yeah. Can, like self talk. Self talk is very important um, mental skill that every endurance athlete has to be able to apply. Self-talk is talking to yourself, is having an internal dialogue. So we've been speaking a lot about the different voices in our heads. And I mean, it's very powerful to have some phrases ready uh, to tell yourself. So take a piece of paper, and try to write down a few things that you would, for example, scream to your friend who is suffering. So imagine you're in a race or you're just a spectator from a, or of a race and you're seeing someone running by and uh, he's obviously suffering. So what would you tell him? You would probably tell him, come on, come on, Cherry, you can do this. I mean, you've trained so hard, you can do this. So that would be maybe something you could tell yourself as well if you were also suffering. And this is what we call self-talk and it's a very powerful skill and you have to practice that but you have to find this one or two phrases that make you tick that make you uh you know continue when things are really getting super difficult that's one thing the other thing is very um simple is uh having some tokens so for example wearing a wristband that reminds you of uh, your children, of that reminds you of the hard work you've done, um, or a picture of someone. Uh, you can put that on your uh, poles when you're running or doing a trail uh, race. Yeah, on the bike. On know. the bike, exactly. So there are many, many things that you can do that help you when you need it. And you, but you cannot do that one week before your race. You have to figure out throughout the season what is making me, maybe music. I always argue, just, you know, put away your music, P put away all the distractions during your training, because they will make you mentally, it will make you mentally stronger, because then you only have yourself, your bike, for example, and your movements, your physical training. But yes, of course, during the race, you can maybe promise yourself, okay, if I go through these 100 to 200 K, K at a certain pace, then I there is an incentive. You can work with small incentives, just small things that make you or keep you going. So those are little tricks that will definitely help you to go through. Yeah. All right. I think we've covered quite a bit on suffering. Um, we could, I think, talk about this for another two, <laughs> two hours, hours, three hours about suffering. But uh, perhaps, I mean, we'll. Um, what are you guys uh, thinking about? I mean, um, sending us an email, um, give us a message so, to just ask about, you know, a few questions on, on suffering. Um.
indoor versus outdoor training and with a, with a specific um, top, well it's specifically for runners or, or cyclists or triathletes I, I, I would say and and why I want to talk about this is I mean looking outside the, the window now it's windy it's autumn um, it's just horrible so do I really want to go for a bike ride outside or do I want to go run outside if it's uh, you know if I, rain or whatever so there's always this discussion especially i think for cyclists of outside versus inside um do you do you train inside yes all the time yeah all the time yeah well not all the time during summer no but in winter yes yes i definitely do that and not, um, nothing in the summer uh yeah sometimes hmm. yeah if i don't have much time so it's a very uh good exercise very I mean, without an hour, you can, I would say, but you're your physical coach, you could assimilate a two or three yeah. hour bike ride easily. Yeah. So it's very eff effective. Yeah, the, the thing is, you could do it outside. Um, you, could, you, you can do every single workout outside, of course. But there's, there's diff different pros and cons of doing it indoor versus outdoor. And that's something we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, now. So when we look at indoor training for, for cycling, Basically, you need a, a turbo trainer. So that's a, a, a trainer, smart trainer, a dumb trainer, rollers, whatever. So you need to have, you're basically cycling inside. And you have now different programs like Zwift, uh, Trainer Road, um, loads of uh, Sufferfest, loads of different companies. We basically create workouts for you to, to train inside. And you can be on your own bike on the turbo trainer, or you can have a, a like a Watt bike, for example, which is like a whole system um for running we basically you just need a treadmill so that's um that's what you need to to for, for the indoor so a few a few things that um a few benefits let's say of of the indoor training um first of all i would say especially on, on for the bike is is safety so safety for different reasons it could be traffic you know, there's no cars when you <laughs> ride your bikes in, inside. Um, there's uh, the weather conditions. It's not slippery. When you go down the hill you, uh, on the bike, okay, that's a skill you need to learn as well when you, when you do ride outside. But you don't have the risk of falling off your bike, you know. Well, <laughs> depends <laughs> maybe for some, but uh, no. So, so really, the first aspect is safety. Um, and there's one guy I'll talk to him a bit later on again. Is is Lionel Sanders? He's a triathlete, and I think one year he had something like three bike accidents, and just then, okay, no more outside. And they're all like car related accidents, and so he just went, okay, I'm just going to cycle in inside. Uh, so, first thing is safety. Um, do you, I mean? Do you, do you feel safe when you ride outside? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, I'm actually. But I'm pretty naive, so knock on wood, never happened something to me. And um, I'm really trying to. I've once learned from a coach that you have to be. Um, you have to imagine yourself uh, flying, um, flying a plane. So or flying a, this. What is it? Yeah. The uh, very fast planes, the... I don't know, like a... Well, whatever. Whatever it jet, is. A jet... Uh, a jet, uh, whatever, yeah. yeah. So, so you have to be very sharp all the time, and I'm really trying to do that. I'm really... I do not um, start daydreaming. I'm very aware of mm. the danger, um, but I feel pretty safe, yes. Because it's... Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I obviously, the more you ride outside, the more... Statistically, you know, yes. the chance of having an accident or something happening, you know, cars, there's more and more cars on, on the road, there's more cyclists as well. Uh, so uh, we all have to share the road and, and that safety aspect is, re is really, um, so if you choose to do all your training outside, I would definitely recommend, for example, in, at this time of the year, autumn or winter, having some lights, reflective uh, clothes and not just go out all black or something, you know, just uh, be as shiny as a Christmas tree. That's what I would say. So that's the sort of negative thing for the outdoor training is the safety, but that's the really positive thing for, for indoor training. You, you, you're just 100% safe all the time. 
Um, a, sec a second aspect for indoor training, which is just super easy. So whether you want to run or ride your bike, it literally takes a few minutes to start your workout. Whereas if you want to run or ride outside, you've got to put the right clothes, um, you have the right gear, the right bike, the whatever, you know, all these different things that you have to prepare um, takes time. You know, it, if you want to really ride outside, by the time you've put all the gear and everything, it's, I mean, okay, some people are quicker than others, but I, I would argue that you take at least 10 minutes, if not 15 minutes, to really prepare for a, a, an outdoor ride. Whereas if you just have your turbo trainer ready inside, then it takes you, you know, two minutes because you just put some dip shorts and you're done. <laughs> so, so everything is ready. So that's the, the setup for the, for the indoor trainer. Another thing is, is the, the controllable. So if you have a workout to do, say I said, okay, I want you to do 10 times two minutes at 250 watts. Outside, yeah, you can do it. It's fine. But then all of a sudden you're going to have to, I don't know, there's a traffic light or there's a bit of undulation on the road. So your power goes up or down or whatever. So with the indoor trainer, the turbo trainer or the speed on, on, on the treadmill, that's just set. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. You can just set it to that speed, set it to that wattage and it just won't change. So that's really one very interesting aspect. However, you might be a little bit addicted to that and you're not maybe able to translate that on the road. So I think it's also very good, important to, to train some intervals on the road outside because, you know, there's never a, a flat, completely flat course or completely, you know, a road without potholes or without this and that. So you, you have to vary a little bit sometimes your speed or adapt your speed to, to the course. So, um, but yeah, there's no disruptions when, when you're indoors. You don't have cars, no traffic lights. Um, and again, it goes back to the safety aspect. But you, you can also just focus 100% on your workout. And, and that's something you, you don't have to think about anything else. You don't have to, like you just said before, you have to be sharp about safety. This you can just put 100% of your attention on the workout. Whereas maybe when you go outside, you have to focus, you know, 75% on your effort, 25%, let's say, on your, your mind has to be focused on traffic. So that, that's really um, something. And, and you use uh, Zwift a little yes. bit, Yes, yeah, right? I do, yeah. So do you think it's, I mean, I, I love it. Do you think it's realistic on how it sort of, sort of recreates a bit the, the... Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, it's very well done, very engaging. So, and what I love about it is that um, it is it has something I in it for every everyone. So, if we would if we would talk about the difference from a psychological point of view between indoor and outdoor, uh, outdoor I would say, like you're saying, twenty five percent of your mind is busy taking care of the of the safety, uh, looking around, um, so you you are actually distracted uh, quite a lot if you're riding outside, which is psychologically much uh, more comfortable uh, because you, you have a good time, you're riding, uh, so it's easier to go outside for most people, whereas inside it's it's pretty, it's dull, so there's... But, but why is it dull? That's the whole thing, why is it boring? Yeah, it's... It's boring because there's only you, the bike, and the movement. So yeah. it's very difficult to keep our mind with our movement because if we want, we can even watch a Netflix movie. So now Swift has created some virtual world which is pretty engaging. So there's something in it for everybody. So if you want, you can go easy and there are enough things that distract you. So from a psychological point of view, it's, it makes it easier to go and, and, and do your workout indoors. Whereas as a sports psychologist, I would then say, look, it's nice, Swift, and keep on doing it, but maybe s put something in front of your screen to make sure you have only your bike, yourself, and your training, so that you're not getting distracted by all the dashboards 
um, it, it has many, I don't know, you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're better in explaining that. But, but, but I think the, 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 the Zwift is, the, if you compare, let's say, there's probably three layers that we're really going to the psychological aspect here of the indoor training. But it's, you have, you know, let's say level one would be, okay, it, weather's bad outside, I'm just going to do my workout inside, easy ride, and I just watch a movie. So you just turn your legs and, you know, that's it. That's just level one of, of training, let's say. Then you go to level two, and I think it's more on Zwift. So you, you forget about music, forget about a uh, uh, movie. You're on Zwift, or so you see yourself, you see your little avatar, you know, uh, cycling away, whatever, and you push yourself. Okay, there's there's some distractions, but I, it's very close, like real life, because yes. you are you have the distractions of the scenery yes. and the changing of the yes. the, 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 the the movement, the, yes. the up and down, whatever. Yes. And I also, think then and then you have level three, which is like you say, no screen, nothing. Just you and the bike, and and no distractions whatsoever. Like you said, put a towel on the computer, and just or the, even the GPS. You don't even have, you have no knowledge about from you and your pedaling. So there's different layers of of where you can play with that. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And I would, I I think that you can. We talked in our previous podcast about suffering. I think. Even with these three layers, I love this. The, the actually the way you explain it, the three layers we can choose. Where do we want to be? Where are we at in our training? Or what is my motivation? Even people who are not are, are following a training program, and there are hundreds of people that just want to move their legs and uh, have their own motivation to do that, and they can choose. They can choose to watch a movie, to listen to a podcast or music, to our podcast maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 uh, and then the second uh, option is to to be really engaged in Swift, which I I I also what I also like about Swift is that you can choose different um, environments where you can ride in. It's like you're preparing your your outing, mm -hmm. which is really nice. So he, there is also some freedom in where you where you want to go. Go yeah, exactly. That's very well done, actually. Or you can choose to go to the third option and say, "Hey, I'm really going to focus on on myself, on my body, on my training, and um, let's see what's happening." So there are many options. But that that's. And outdoors, really you tough. don't have that. No. You don't have that option. But that's really tough. I mean, the, now we're really into the <laughs> into the thick of it about the psychological benefits of riding indoors. And I remember, for example, we first, you know, I I, I came to you to, to to train that aspect of being strong mentally throughout the race, let's say. And you, you were telling me, okay, no music. So I got rid of the music, and I, that was actually before I started Zwift. And I remember doing some intervals where for 8, 9, or 10 minutes, or 15 minutes, I would just basically train myself to look and think of nothing else but just that. And I would only get the beep when the interval was finished. And I must say that it you know the first interval you do that of 10 minutes is like the longest interval in your life. But then it gets better and better and better. Now, there's uh, yeah, there's not so many times you can do these sort of workouts. But um, for me, Zwift is a very co very cool compromise. Of course, some people have Zwift and then like a Netflix and then music and whatever, like the whole setup. You know, you look like you're in a video game or something. But I just have when I have Zwift on, I just have Zwift. I have nothing else, no music, no nothing. And I think it's a nice compromise between. The psychological toughness of being inside, but then the outdoor benefits of having that sort of feel for the road because it goes up and down, uh, the changing of rhythms and, and all that. So so that's where I think, but, but for sure, a huge benefit of indoor training is, is, is mental toughness improvement. That's, there's, you know, really want to, if that's one of your weaknesses, then indoor training is the perfect tool. Yes. 
And I remember you one thing, I think you told me the, an exercise could be, okay, it's it's a nice day outside, let's go for a run. Well, actually, no, you're going to do your run in on a treadmill. Yes. Yeah. Or, you know, so so we're going kind of against what the, the, the benefits we say before of safety, for example, of a bike, but you, you can go reverse it to, to improve it. So it's a nice day, well, actually, I'm going to go and train inside. Yes. And that, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's like a pressure cooker for your mind. So um, we, we, in a short time, we are forced to to deal and with only ourselves, uh, and especially when it's difficult. Then what do you do? Normally, you would uh, uh, really um, want to be distracted, hmm. to have a conversation with a friend, if still possible, or to listen to music, or start. Uh, whatever, looking at your watts or looking at how many kilometers or looking at the clock. But now it's only your, you and your body. Um, and um, I think if you integrate some of those trainings throughout the year, you will definitely grow stronger. It's actually like a meditation practice. So it's uh, like we're trying to meditate while doing our exercise. Yeah, no, no, that's uh, definitely. And I think we've got a few examples of that. Though, and. and one of the um, the guys which is quite famous in, in triathlon called Lionel Sanders, I, I, I talked to him about him before, he rides a huge amount on Zwift and even runs on, on the treadmill and has his little Zwift. So for, for me, running is definitely a bit next level again in terms of mental toughness, running inside on the treadmill. Yeah, it's, it's really if I really have to do it, otherwise I usually go outside. But, you know, I think if you compare running to cycling, you can still have a pretty good workout outside for for, 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 for um, running, whereas cycling, if you want to go for two hours, three hours, that's also just if the weather's bad, it's just miserable. Whereas you can easily do it inside, easily. You know, uh, running um, usually a workout is between an hour, you know, 40, half an hour to an hour and a half, let's say, on a long run or two hours. That's bearable outside, even if the weather's bad. But you know, four hour bike ride outside in the rain no no thanks no. but um yeah and this guy Lionel Sanders he just does pretty much 100% of his workouts on Zwift wow. and he's one of the best uh, cyclists uh, in the sport so it doesn't mean that you're you know you're a worse cyclist because you do it inside there's a huge amount of benefits to, to, to do it uh, there's something we didn't we forgot to mention is that when you're inside, you don't have the cooling effect. Mm -hmm. Effect, you, okay, you can have fans, but even with, you can put how many fans you want. Open the windows, you don't have that natural airflow. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna sweat a lot more. So that's, it could be a benefit. It could also be a negative thing. So the benefit is, well, you're gonna, it's gonna be very hot. So you can train in those hot conditions. Um, but you know you gotta basically have enough nutrition to fuel those workouts, and probably more than the outdoor ones, yes. because you're sweating huge amounts yes. and basically losing all the all the minerals. Um, and to be very careful on your bike, actually, to because if you sweat a lot on your bike, you have a lot of salt, and that can so you have to clean your bike regularly. But um, and another example I had was uh, Brett Sutton, the the famous uh, mm -hmm. triathlete coach, coach who you know he. Some of his athletes won won Kona many times, especially the women. And he had, I think, a session was like a four or three or four hour run yes. in a super small room, and on a treadmill, set the pace at I don't know fourteen k an hour, and just run four hours in this small room. <laughs> yes, with no music, nothing, pretty no dark. I think yeah. there was one uh, one little window. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so sorry. That's like that's crazy, definitely, yeah. you know, next level. But that's that goes back to the psychological aspect, huh? Yes. That's your training your mind yes. really. That's really training your mind, yeah. Because then you will meet all the voices in your head and then you will be more aware of what's happening within you when you are facing this huge challenge. Also what we should not forget to mention is that the perceived effort indoors is so much higher. And that's what it automatically not only makes it diff more difficult physically, so that's something maybe we should also mm -hmm. uh, uh, warn people for, that 
you know, one hour bike ride does not equal one hour outside. Um, so physically it's more, more stressful, but also psychologically, because the perceived effort is much, much higher. And um, yeah, probably because there's no distraction or whatsoever. Well, on Zwift, for example, if you stop pedaling, you know, there, there's zero watts, you're not moving. Yeah. On the cycling, you always have a bit of up and down or whatever, exactly. outdoors, you can have, you have more rest periods outside. Yes. And indoor, if you don't pedal, you don't, <laughs> there's no, no you know, no. it doesn't work. So you have to constantly pedal, it's yes. true. Um, it's true, the perceived effort, in, it depends. I think in some cases, it could be harder inside or harder outside. It depends, I guess, on which, on the intervals. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, it's generally, easier outside to push through certain wattage um, because you have to do it, it, actually just the other day I did a workout where I was two times 30 minutes up a hill and I easily did the watt, wattage I wanted now you do the same two times 30 minutes inside and that's just really tough yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's really tough yes so well tough psychologically mm -hmm. but also sometimes Physically, because when you're up in on a hill, sometimes it goes a bit harder. So instead of going, I don't know, 280 watts, I was going. Maybe sometimes only 300 is harder, but then sometimes it's 250. So you have rest times. So you go a bit over, under, changing your rhythms. If you just set your trainer on erg mode and it's like 280 and you just have to do that for yeah. 30 minutes, yes. that's, that's really tough. Yes. No. yes. So, yeah, indoor training. I mean, I definitely recommend it. Um, I use it a whole year round, mm -hmm. really. Um, I usually do my, for sure, the long rides outside. But during the week, um, because it's just so time convenient, I just hop on the bike and that's it. You know, within an hour I've got my, and, I've, and I train to very specific zones, mm -hmm. specific paces or, or you know, um, wattage that you can be, you can be so precise in what you want to do versus outside where you have to plan really well ahead and say okay I want to go up that hill at that time and then I have to come back and yeah I just I just think okay I'm gonna do five times ten minutes of this or five times two minutes whatever and it's all done boom yeah so for me it's more the convenient aspect yes but definitely also the safety Yes. Aspect. Yeah. I, I've had very close calls <laughs> yeah. in, in, you know, you have cars overtaking you, uh, you have some going the wrong way, whatever. It, it's just, you know, obviously I, I ride a lot. So this, for me, that's the, the biggest uh, thing. But um, yeah, and outdoors. So let's go now to the benefits of the, the outdoor um, workouts and something you can't get inside for sure is the, the feel for the mm -hmm. road or yes. for the um, you know cycling or running you know and yeah. so the feel when you go if you're running a trail you know there's no way you can replicate that in inside on a treadmill yeah. so the difference of you know um, the, the, the different level of, ter of terrain so it could be sand it could be rocky it could be Whatever, same on the mountain. If you're doing mountain biking, you know, there's no way you can simulate that. Okay, I, on my tax, for example, on the turbo trainer, it when you go on cobbles, it goes blah, 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 blah. yeah. So that's really cool, but it's not the same thing. If you really ride on cobbles, it's really tough, you know. Whereas on tax, it's kind of you feel it a little bit, but it's not, you know, it's not the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, definitely the, the a huge benefit, of course, of the outdoor workout is the feel. Then reality, because Unless you're becoming a pro Zwift racer, we're all, our races mostly are going to be outside. So, you know, you tr you can train where you will race or on the same terrain, similar terrain. So the reality aspect is is something very important. So it's important to 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 train outside as well and not just only indoor. And um, yeah, like I said, fresh air. You know, you have that cooling effect constantly. You have fresh air as in just oxygen, just have some real air that <laughs> you can breathe. And if you go for an hour, imagine you just want to go an easy workout, one hour. Just go for like a little bike ride. It's actually probably nicer to do it outside, get some fresh air, you know, and, and take the sun, vitamin D, 
you know, and, and whereas in your inside, in your basement, you know, you don't get that. So I think, I think that's, that's uh, another, another positive thing. Scenery we talked about outside, obviously, you're not going to have the same one inside. Um, group rides with, with friends, you know, just join your friends, join your running club, you know, cycling club, whatever. Um, the social aspect, although we talked about Zwift, that's, that's really um, a very great way of having a social. That's why I love Zwift because it's really about the community in Zwift. So you can you can have that inside, but for sure outside you you're with uh, your friends. Do you ride a lot with friends friends or well, how do you? On Swift. No, or outside. Outside, yeah. outside with friends. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And uh, also, I think it's important if we look at the psychological side uh, to ask yourself what motivates me to go out or to go in. So in your case, you like the communi community um, for Swift and if you go out, uh, maybe you write alone. But, but the, the nice thing is you have a choice. So if you know what motivates you, you can choose. If you like nice weather, you can go outside. Um, but if you like to be competitive and there is not a friend available to compete with you, you can go on Swift and you can try to compete because there are so many options. You can go and ride in a community. You can try to uh, uh, um, yeah. subscribe for a race. But, but I think the, the riding with friends is also, it's, it's a positive thing of the outdoor experience. And I think it also can be a negative one because too many times I see people who train always with people, with other people, with friends, and you see it on Strava, ride with uh, this and that, uh, run with this and that, whatever. And But when you're in your race, you're on your own, yeah. generally, yes. or with people that you don't know. So it could be motivating in one way to run to run with friends, but when the real race happens, you see a lot of people failing to, to meet their goals because they're not with their friends anymore. Mm, yeah. So, so that's, that's something, I don't know what you, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So it's again about what do you want? What is your plan? Why yeah. do you want it? Why do you do what you do? Do you go out with friends because only your friend is able to motivate you to go on yeah. or is it just because it's weekend and it's fun? Um, but you have to separate that. And I think definitely there is so much to say for going uh, out, out on, a, on a run or on a bike ride completely on your own and um, just uh, face the, the, boring, the boring part of, uh, of, of, of you, uh, you and uh, you alone. Yeah, because that's, yeah, in a way, you're not always going to race going to be with other people that you just can chat. No. And in some aspects, for example, in Ironman, you're not allowed to draft. So you cannot no, ride no, with someone no, else. No. So unless you have been on your own for a long time, for 180K, you have to experience that beforehand. Yes. And that's why I think if you indoor, you don't necessarily have to do the same amount of time. But I think the indoor trainer will basically bring you to a point of you know a very solid point so you might say okay if you can if you i think if you're able to do 100k solo inside let's say you know it's like, let's say three three and a half hours you've done much you more. know i've done much more yes but i mean let's say you do that yes i think that gives you enough bullets to go yes. four four and a half or five hours yes. outside on your own you know I, I, it's not a one-to-one -one. i think you have yeah. more gains inside on, on the mental aspect than outside but um and yeah, the friends, I mean, on Zwift, for example, you'll, or, or any other, you, you'll always have people uh, around you or whatever. So it's, that's good. But it's not necessarily the, your friends, but you, you always, so the, the social aspect, I think, is, can be, you can make new friends on, on, on yeah. Zwift. You know, I, sometimes you have a race and you're, you know, hanging on uh, or you just missed the pack or whatever. And you end up with this one guy and you worked with him for 20K. And I don't know, he's from Norway, for example. Yeah. And you just then follow the guy on Strava or on Zwift and you might end up talking to him and making a new friend. You, you never know. 
Yes. And the same thing goes happens outside. Yes. You know, you're on a hill, all of a sudden you overtake someone, start talking, and you make a new friend. So I think you can do both inside and, and outside. Yes. Yes, but yes. I, I think for me, the, the outdoor one, although group ride with friends is a very positive thing in terms of the social aspect of the sport, you, like you said very correctly, you have to know why you do the sport. So if you do the sport to be social, then for sure, go Fantastic. right outside. Yes. But if you do the sport to be competitive, okay, have some social rides. But those rides will not be your no. main training uh, sessions because that's not what you're training for. So, yeah. Um, and an another thing I, I really want to, to, obviously the different terrain, we talk about that for the road, the track, the forest, that, that's something a very, very, I mean, the, that's the, the, one of the biggest advantages of the outdoor training is that you just have, you know, the whole, you know, out, outdoors, your playground, you can, you will change, vary the different um, difficulties. Um, I mean, there's not many trainers, for example, or treadmills, well, you have some treadmills, you can go up and down, but it's not going to be the same, same. thing, no. you know, uh, going a trail running, uh, phew, yeah, how can you replicate that? But trail run, you know, so, <laughs> and a huge uh, part for me is the, the, the cross training aspects. So not necessarily, let's say you're a runner and in the winter, you know, or let's say cycling, for example, cycling or whatever. The weather's miserable, there's snow or whatever. Why well, are you still gonna go uh, ride in the mountains when it's like snow? Uh, well, no, you can't because it's just a not possible or it's not safe. But then there's other sports you could try, exactly like cross country skiing. I'm a huge fan. I don't do almost any long rides in the winter. I, my long ride is a two, three, or four hour cross country ski uh, session, yeah. and that's fantastic. Yes, and also and mentally, mentally step out of your comfort zone. If you always stay in your comfort zone, even though in your training there is a lot of outside comfort, because uh, when we put stress on the body, it's outside comfort, but still it's your regular thing, cycling, running. So you mean outside your comfort zone in terms of a new sport? A new sport, a new, yes. Something yes, completely, completely new. Take on swimming yes. or take on... Yes, exactly. You know, well, yes. normal skiing, yes. cross-country skiing. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And this is not only good for the body, because obviously you need to, you need to be careful not to injure yourself. But uh, suppose you're doing it right, then it will definitely help you to improve your strength, your endurance, because those sports, they are uh, a fantastic way to yeah. improve. But also mentally, because you're learning something new, so you will get back your motivation. The fire Refresh will up. light up. Yeah. And also, even if you're someone who likes to do something really at a certain level, you will definitely get frustrated because it's something new. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the frustration? How do you deal with all the hours or maybe all the effort you have to put into the new sport to, to get going? And this is some fantastic experience to build up your mental strength. Yeah, and, and also I, th I think that... If you haven't, so for example, for me in the winter, I'll do indoor training in, in, in for cycling on my Toba trainer, but I'll, I'll do sessions of, you know, an hour, an hour and a half, whatever, but not very, not over the top. The long stuff, I'll just go, I'll just go skiing. And when you come, comes March, April, the weather's getting better. You're like really excited to go back outside for a long ride. And you're really looking forward to it because you haven't done it for a while and you can just go out for 100k, 180k, whatever, big ride. But if you have done this the whole winter and you've put yourself through misery of going around the lake, you know, six hours in the rain and whatever, and you've done that whole time, you know, I think you're, you're I mean, personally, I would not feel there's fresher. The so there's the willpower yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, the willpower is just gone because you've put so much effort in pushing yourself to continue doing this sport or this cycling or this running whereas you could have easily done with the same effect physically and, and even mentally much better uh, another sport yeah and also, and, and also for, for 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 runners for example there's so many people just run they run the whole year mm -hmm. and the best example i have is killian jornet who's you know arguably the best trail runner ever you know currently and ever basically 
the guy I listened to on a, on a different podcast, on the Ritual podcast, and he was saying he doesn't actually run between November and March. He lives in Norway. You know, Norway between November and March, A, it's dark pretty much the whole, <laughs> whole day. And there's snow everywhere. So he, and he doesn't run one single kilometer. All he does is the, the you know, the ski touring where you just basically mm-hmm. walk kind of, well, or run for him up the mountain with the skis. You yeah. put the, the foot fuck underneath the, the, the um, you put the skins underneath the, the ski and he just does that. And cross country skiing, I think he does as well. He does some racing, increased cross country skiing and racing in, uh, in tour in ski touring. So that keeps keeps his fitness obviously really high because you can as well go up the mountains, so very high altitude, which is great for his summer trails. He keeps the altitude. He's doing different muscles. When he goes down, he's skiing, so there's not as much impact because obviously skiing, there's well, unless you're doing moguls, there's, there's just no impact. So he's 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 doing a completely different kind of training mm-hmm. for almost six months of the year. And yet he's the best runner ever. So that doesn't really justify to say we have to go running in December in the rain outside, you know. So um, cross training, I, th- I think, is a great way of keeping, well, like you said, physically to, to work different parts of your body, try something new, but just actually just have that different go through phases in your season and and you f- you'll feel so much fresher coming yes. back into your your let's say number one sport yes. yeah and it's also i think for some a challenge to let go and to have yes. confidence that it will come back and that you will come back even stronger so it's also again another mental challenge or to a challenge that will grow your mental side is to be able to say, look, I'm not running. I'm not go- going to put that stress on my ligaments and on my on on, on, on my body. I'm just, I'm just gonna get get it and try to do another sport and see what happens. See yeah. what I discover about myself and see how much I will gain uh, from it. Yeah, so I th- no, def- definitely there's this really something to be learned about yourself learning new skills, learning new things in a new sport that you can translate and say, well, okay, maybe you were, you're, you're doing marathons every year and then you say, well, now I want to get into trail running. Having maybe done another sport during the winter gives you the confidence that, hey, I, I can learn something new so I can become this. Or, or you're a runner and you would take up cycling. Mm-hmm. So, hey, I've done different things so I can learn that again you know so def- definitely I would for sure advise to also take a break in the winter yes. for example and just say yeah, like you said the ability to let go take a rest week or something but you know I mentioned cross-country skiing which is really tough huh, yes. by the way so it's not like you're you're like having an, an easy day but it could be like snowshoeing it's it's of course you, it doesn't have to be an activity which is super tough it could be any activity that kind of raises your heart rate a little bit something different and for sure come back the season where you need to go back on the road need to put your running shoes back again you'll be feeling much better and it's okay to start not from scratch but to start again that's what pro athletes do they periodize their training they go you know you have your 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 base training, your build, and then you have your race, and then you start again, you go through the motions again. They're not always at peak fitness the whole time. So it's important to, yeah, to, 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 to let go of that a little bit. So the, the outdoors will enable you to, to, to do that, training different sports. But the indoor as well, it could be swimming. It could be, um, you know, different, different things. So, um, but yeah, so, so I think that what would you, what would be your your? I mean, for, for me, my my takeaways for indoor versus outdoor, the big the big thing for me, number one is the safety aspects on for the bike. Let's say that's that's number one, um, and 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 probably the the fact that it's just so easy to do it inside, no faffing about, um, you know, 
if you, if you need to, if you run out of food, you can just literally just hop off and go to your kitchen or something, you know. So <laughs> that's also something easy. That that's what, for me the the and and definitely the psychological aspect. Yes, I, I yeah. agree. But um, not to forget that out that outside we get, you know, the real experience, the real feel, and we should not forget that. We have to to train that. But um, I'm a big fan of indoor training, so I hope uh, hope. Um, Everyone out there will be maybe convinced to to try it by not necessarily treadmill, but I think for cyclists for sure, a turbo trainer is is a good uh, is a good investment. Yes. All right. Good. So let us know, guys. If uh, are you a fan of indoor training or not at all? I mean, I know some guys who just don't ride one single minute inside they just do outside the whole year round but for cycling another point is you could do road training in the summer and then you move to gravel or mountain biking during the winter you know so there's different things like that but for, for sure i think for me there is definitely some um, pros and cons for both but and i think a mixture of, of them is a, is a is a good idea business like uh, yeah what's well, your plan uh, so my plan tomorrow actually it's holiday now so uh, we're doing a bit uh, free ride two weeks uh, so I'm still working uh, today I worked with a few uh, clients yesterday as well and tomorrow I'll go for a swim hmm. really looking forward to that actually my, I my just uh, started to uh, to swim again. I saw you went a bit fast the other day. Uh, I, I I tried to go a bit <laughs> faster, but I should work on my technique, so maybe you can work. Uh, you can help okay. me with that. <laughs> uh, and then next week also a little bit free ride, so a bit of uh, working with clients, a bit free, and and uh, yeah, that's it actually. Any other activities that you're? Yeah, doing? Um, I'm actually um, starting uh, to really get into my yoga again. It's something I, I do a lot in winter. I follow hot yoga classes and it's fantastic. So it really gives you... Where do you do that? In Nyon. Okay. The yoga moves. They're really, really good. Yeah, I love it. How, um, does, it, how, does, it, how does it work with hot yoga? Do they have like heaters so, or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they do. They do uh, heat the room. And, um, and with, like with humid? Is like humid hot? It's humid, or is it... humid and, and hot. Hot, warm. Okay, so, so they put like these steamers type of thing. Yeah, they put one steamer I've depending never tried on the on on the weather outside. Yeah. But the the room is uh, being uh, heated with an uh, air conditioning. Uh, How heater. hot is it? Like fifty degrees? Well, or forty-five normally, degrees. Normally, or... normally in official hot yoga, I think you are supposed to have a room that is like thirty-eight or forty degrees. Ah, okay. It's okay, but this is a little bit less. So okay. it's not official hot hot yoga. It's warm yoga. But still, it's pretty warm. Depends on where you are in the room, and um, it's one and a half hours, so it's pretty oh. intense. And um, I, but I love it. So it gives me really you sweat a lot. Yeah, you sweat a just lot. just by staying in there. You yes. sweat a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's fantastic. So I would definitely recommend people that uh, to do in winter yeah. to keep your strength, but get a bit uh, more uh, souplesse. Yeah. Yes, flexibility. Uh, to get over injuries, to give your uh, body rest, to be able to connect better with your body, to communicate better with your body. It has a lot of advantages. I'm a really big, big fan. I used to do like a strength Pilates class a while ago. I really enjoyed that. I never had a yoga class. I was stiff as a rod like not so long ago. So I, I did definitely improved my flexibility by stretching a lot. Um, and that's definitely something I, I would definitely recommend for sure. Um, but yoga is something I never tried, so maybe I'll, I'll join one of those classes. It's pretty muscular, but it's not as muscular as the Pilates. So it has it has more rest. It's more on flexibility, and it's uh, it's uh, it's as the teacher always said. It's not a workout; it's a work in. So mm. it's really trying to connect with the body, with the breathing, which then. I really benefit from also when I'm running, when I'm cycling, when I'm swimming. 
So it all, all connects. However, it's not a quick fix. It's not a baguette no. magique. So you really have to invest time to start to, to get this click mentally. It's like everything else. Yes. You just, uh, yes, if you go true. to one class, no, no, it's okay, nothing. you get benefit. But yeah. if you go five, six, seven, eight weeks in yes. a row, then yes. you'll feel Then you'll sure. feel really yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. All right, good stuff. Yeah. Um, um, well, I was this morning, I was with my um, physio slash strength called coach extraordinaire Petri. And so we had a, um, a strength session and I've, I've lifted the heaviest weights ever. So I was pretty proud of that. Wow. One. So it was good. So uh, he definitely put me through a lot of pain this morning. Um, it's also holidays. So my wife's got me all sorts of uh, house stuff. So, uh, dissembling <laughs> wardrobes, reassembling others, and then uh, it's just house stuff. So, that's uh, really interesting. So, can't do as much sport because obviously then she she's at home so she she can see me if I do something or not. Um, I have also next week a kids camp. So, I run these, these kids camp through the, the holidays. I'll have 20 kids, age 6 to 10 next week um, that I have to take care of so I'm uh, praying for better weather otherwise it's just going to be horrible uh, well it's going to be good fun but we you know obviously the whole point of these camps is to be outside cycle outside do ex outdoor activities but if you're you know 10 hours a day inside with uh, 20 kids which you know <laughs> are full of energy that's uh, yeah that's a bit of a challenge and uh, what else? Um, I we just started a Zwift. We talked about Zwift before. A Zwift racing league. So I've got a team. My my Jura Sports team is competing there, and I must say this is uh, pretty brutal. So we had a bit of our first um, uh, <laughs> first competition on Tuesday. So it's going to be every Tuesday for the next uh, ten weeks. And um, we there was myself, Alec, and Julian racing on 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 the um, on Tuesday, and that was really, really, really tough. So, yeah, it's good fun uh, to push ourselves, um, but um, that's something uh, like we talked about before on suffering that we're going to have to basically suffer once a week uh, doing all these things. But it's good fun. Yeah, it's a, it's a first time Zwift does a league, so I just thought, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. We, you know, we go if we we're last. It, it really doesn't matter. The point is to participate and have fun and. So after after the ride with had beer with Alec and we had Julian on the phone. So you see, it's it's more about participating, pushing ourselves than really competing against because the level out there is just ridiculous. So um, yeah, it's just just about having fun. So yeah, that's about it. And I think uh, yeah, also did a lot of gardening. That was my big 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 achievement of this week. So that was kind of my workouts to be honest. Um, gardening, that's it. All right, so thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed listening to this uh, podcast. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Send us an email, little message, thumbs up. See you later. Thank you. Bye.